is the fate and transformation. Oh, it studies the fate and transformation of new market pesticides. We've done a lot of work with uh, neonicotinoids in both uh, agricultural waters as well as some wastewaters and drinking waters. We work with complex exposure mixtures and how these move and transport and transform through space and time. Kind of uh, one of our backbone pieces is also green stormwater infrastructure. Actually, my background is understanding uh, stormwater quality and the contaminants within stormwater and trying to use engineered natural treatment systems like bioretention so that we can see if there's nasty things like um, in, you know, stormwater and or nasty things like, uh, you know, oil and grease in there, what happens if it goes into there. And we also do work um, with plant uptake and metabolism of emerging contaminants. So this is kind of our, our main thrust, but it the lots of different um, directions. And what we're going to be talking about today is this work on complex exposure mixtures. So why is this an important and interesting thing? First is that wastewater effluent dominated streams are and so-called de facto water reuse it, are actually really quite common in temperate regions. So let's define what this means first. Is that um, is a, Effluent dominant or a uh, effluent dominated stream is simply one where during base flow conditions, the majority of the flow or a substantial plurality of the flow is, is dominated by treated wastewater effluent. And de facto water reuse is where wastewater treatment effluent goes into a stream and is subsequently reused by humans. We oftentimes think of this as being primarily driven by drinking water treatment plant intakes, which is very common, right? We're all downstream of someone else, but it's also, you know, we can interpret use as, as broadly too. And so that can also mean contact recreation or impacting the ecology in an anthropocentric manner too. And actually, if we look at, we think, you know, we think of effluent dominated streams and water, de facto water reuses, we think of it as being an arid phenomenon, but in fact, it's actually, if we look at where this happens, it's a lower percentage in terms of, of dominating flows oftentimes in temperate regions, but there are actually more streams, and this is perhaps due, you know, mostly due to population distribution, but there are more streams that are, are affluent dominated in temperate regions than there are in arid regions. So why do we care about this? One of the things is that it, wastewater treatment plants, unless they're explicitly designed for uh, water reuse, in for human consumption or irrigation or something like that are not, they're designed to remove pathogens, particles, nutrients, right? But, and they can do these things very well, but they're not explicitly designed to remove things like pharmaceuticals. And pharmaceuticals are known to have deleterious effects on aquatic biota like fish, even at very low concentrations. And so some things like, for example, the anti-diabetic drug metformin, it can, we found it in our the stream at 10,000 nanogram per liter. And these can do things like disrupt the normal hormone functional or the growth and development of fish. Now, is this necessarily a great human health risk? I mean, I think, I think one of my undergraduates calculated how much water you'd need. It would be like, you know, thousands of liters a day to drink in order to get like a ph ph uh, pharmacological dose of a single pill in, you know, if you were drinking this or something. So it's, probably not a great human risk because these things are, uh, I mean, they're designed to help people, right? But in complex mixture and combinations and low chronic dosages, these can affect, I mean, they're designed to be biologically active and they can affect aquatic biota. And so we know that pharmaceuticals can undergo these different types of attenuation processes as they're discharged into the environment from wastewater treatment plants to the downstream, um, you know, as they move downstream, right? We know that these pharmaceuticals can interact with this, the bed sediment, right, via sorption, right? So it's like chemical sorbing onto the sediment or something like that. We can interact with the, the groundwater, right? Like it can, you know, depending on where they go, they can actually go in and out of the groundwater. They can actually bioaccumulate potentially and interact with the organisms that are there, photodegrade or biodegrade by bacteria or potentially even plants. 
So one of the things that we're really interested in and are in this research group here is understanding complex mixtures. And we know that this is an interesting thing is because imagine that you are a fish, right? And the reason that why this is important is because there can be so-called interactive effects. And one of these is that, I mean, say you had drug A and drug B, you can say that A and B is equal to A plus B, right? So one plus one is two kind of thing. But we also know that there are other types of interactive effects, which is like why you know one plus one can equal more than one in terms of the actual effect inside of it. And they can also counteract each other. So this is the reason why if you go into a doctor's office and you're about to be prescribed a drug, the first thing that the doctor is gonna ask you is she'll say, are you taking anything else with this? And that's because they don't wanna have any adverse drug-drug interactions. And fish don't have that choice, right? They are just subject to whatever is in the water that they're exposed to all the time. And so these complex mixtures and how they change in space and time due to interactive effects with the stream can have mean that the total impacts to the aquatic biota change and in space and time. And so that's a really important thing that we are trying to uncover. So that's why our kind of what our critical need that we identified here was trying to understand the dynamics of these changing mixtures in effluent dominant systems as it goes from the wastewater treatment plant, um, spatial temporal changes in the mixture. You can have evolution of the, you know, the original chemical from the parent compound, right? So that would be what is leads to some sort of daughter product, right? And so those could be different for, in terms of the effects on the fish, all the way potentially to interactions with um, humans. So the, I'll just kind of introduce kind of the team. This is actually funded by a, a USGS National Competitive Grant. Um, and so we, I was the team lead um, and we, and Dana Culpin is that, um, he, used to and is the leader of the USGS uh, Emerging Contaminants Research Group and is based here in Iowa City. Um, and then um, so we kind of kind of did the chemical stuff. And then we also worked with Rebecca Clapper at the UW-Milwaukee Freshwater uh, Sciences. And, and the, she's the director of the Great Lakes Genomic Center. And then Luca Wanowitz does work with fish and genomic assays. So I'm going to give you some background on our study site here. So this is in eastern Iowa. So this is actually Johnson County and uh, where um, the University of Iowa is. So it's really handy to have a field site that's only a couple miles away from campus. And we established four official USGS monitoring stations here. So there's the North Liberty Wastewater Treatment Plant is an advanced membrane bioreactor facility. So it's actually one of the highest performing um, treatment plants in the state and has numerous awards and it far out exceeds all of its permit requirements in terms of nutrient discharge for phosphorus and nitrogen. And, and like whenever we've measured it or they are measuring, like they get zero E. coli in their effluent because there's a membrane facility and stuff and whatnot. But because it is not explicitly designed to remove pharmaceuticals, there are those in the effluent. We established another site about hundred meters upstream and then hundred meters downstream. And so that kind of represents the mixing zone so this would be background, basically, the effluent. And then and this would be the mixing zone over here. And we know that now it's evenly mixed. And then we have another, there's a real-time USGS gauging station down here, about five kilometers uh, downstream. And so this tells us the flows in real time. And, um, and so we could actually monitor time as well. The others we have to manually measure. And so one of the things that you'll immediately see at this gauging station is kind of this you know, up and down sinusoidal wave and the flow, and that is the stream flow, which means that at base flow, this is largely dominated by wastewater, right? This is basically just a discharge pattern of wastewater going into the stream, and the stream flow goes up and down as a result of that, right? You see that kind of by diurnal flow patterns. So first off, we demonstrated that indeed that this, our study site, is a effluent dominated stream. You know, you can see this little trickle up here. It's a still relatively small treatment plant. You know, it's a, 
you know, North Liberty is actually the second fastest growing city in Iowa. There's a lot of growth and development, new infrastructure and stuff, but it's um, still a fairly small plant. I mean, it's not Des Moines or Chicago or Minneapolis or something. And then you can see that it kind of goes in, despite the fact it's called Muddy Creek, it's actually a quite clear water and sandy bottom and stuff like that. Um, and you can see that the flow percentage, so we were sampling everything at base flow here. So these are actual our, our measurements. And you can see that the, you know, the outfall dominates the downstream flow. So th this is meaning that, you know, we've got a mean of 80%, but it's like typically about 90% of the flow in the stream is due to the treated effluent. So during base flow conditions. And so what we did was we collected, these were basically grab samples and we collected these all throughout the year over a course of a two year time period. Here's Jack, one of our undergraduates on the team. And we monitored for, you know, basic water quality parameters in here. And you can see that it's a, actually a really flashy system, but all these different uh, all these different dots here are our sample collection. We were targeting base flow because that's what we wanted to try and get at in our study. We weren't, you know, in comparison to sometimes when we've done, you know, when you're trying to do stormwater sampling and it's like, you're trying to catch that, you know, first flush or something like that. And it's a very flashy system. I'm glad, <laughs> so it's nice to be able to go in and we're taking these at base flow. And we were very successful at being able to do that. So we, what we did was the USGS ran samples and the University of Iowa, we ran samples separately targeting some overlap things, you know, different time periods, different frequency, a little bit different, but it, then what we were able to do was use these um, different analysis methods and be able to quantify um, pharmaceuticals in here. So we were able to do over 100 for the USGS method and 14 of the most common ones that were the most common ones in our preliminary data set. So let's just jump right into here to some of our data here. So this, so I'm happy to send you the some of the, the original papers because this is, um, there's a lot of data in here. So you, you can see what we did was we looked at all these different pharmaceutical classes. And you can see our, our these are the effluent and the downstream detection frequency. So some of these things are detected in every single sample. And these are the concentrations. We found all different types of pharmaceutical classes at really pretty high concentrations in, at these different sites. And so, you know, some of these things are like you would expect to see in terms of like over the counter things and anti inflammatory. And a lot of these, a lot of them are also dominated by um, things like uh, antidepressants as well. So, some of the most common ones that we found were um, some things like uh, over the counter or chronic conditions would be things like antihistamines, which like that makes sense. People take allergy medicines in the summer in Iowa, it's a very common thing. Um, but then some of the, and as well as things for mon managing type two diabetes and antidepressants are very common and make up a large fraction of the mass in here. So this is kind of like our reporting of initial data. We also had looked at things through kind of a time perspective and by far the majority of, or the largest were in the affluent, but you can see some of the total concentrations I mean, they, some of these are in the tens of thousands of nanograms per liter. So it's reasonably high in terms of total. And when we say total, it's the total of the 109 compounds that we chose to measure for. So this is a standard USGS measurement method. Um, and what we found was that there was a differences in a seasonal variation here. And there's essentially nothing in the upstream, which kind of makes sense. One of the reasons why we selected this as a study site is because not only is it a small temperate region effluent down stream, but there's really only one point source on here. There's relatively new infrastructure, so probably not lots of like leaky septic systems or something like that. And then there is the, there is this urban or rural to urban gradient. So we do see some things like some atrazine and some things like that in, in the upstream that gets kind of diluted out later. And so there is some agricultural influence, but really no uh, pharmaceuticals in there. So one of the big take-homes here that we discovered is that there's greater chemical mass in the affluent 
during warm seasons. So if we looked at, at our, so the diameter of the pi here is the, is proportional to the total mass in the system, right? So if we look at affluent downstream one, downstream two, so this is going down the creek here, right? During the warm season, it's much larger than the cool season. And the mixture composition is quite a bit different too. And you can see the big thing that dominates in, in the, the affluent itself is this antihistamine in terms of the warm season, which kind of makes sense, right? There's a lot of people that do have allergy medications due to seasonal allergies that are there. And so during the cool season, you see that representation, that mixture change quite a bit. But even as you go from affluent to downstream one to downstream two, even in 100 meters, that mixture changes substantially. So the difference between how that mixture evolves is big. So yeah, that antihistamine is there. If we look at how it moves, you know, 100 meters downstream to five kilometers downstream, that mixture changes quite a bit. And so we know that in time, so it's seasonal variations, even just, um, you know, some random variations in, in time, what is in the input makes a big difference. But then as you go along the stream, that makes a big difference. So the total is much greater in the warm season, but it actually attenuates faster. So by the time we get down to the downstream two, it's actually a smaller mass during the warm season than in the cool season. So that's, I mean, that could be due to a, a couple of different factors. We don't completely uh, know why, um, or we, we can't conclusively know why. I mean, it could be due to several different things. So one of the things that we really wanted to investigate here was so-called differential attenuation of compounds and how that could contribute to evolving complex mixtures. When we say differential attenuation, what we mean is that you've got a mixture, right? Sort of like all the different pieces of the pie and something might drop out because it interacts with the bed sediment or it biodegrades or photodegrades or something changes. Or you could have it change from a parent compound to a daughter product. Right. And so you could make it so that, you know, something about it changes. And so differential attenuation might mean that the total mixture mass might actually not be changing, but the, the complex mixture itself might have a different like toxicity profile to fish. And so this was actually quite evident when we looked at the F or if we looked at like the top um, compounds that were in here. For example, if we looked at so for example, we could see the rank order of these compounds. And so these are all the measurements that we had. So for example, like metformin was number two to start out with. So it's a very well represented and it goes to rank number one. So it's basically very similar. And venofaxine goes from one to three. So really pretty similar. Whereas citroplan is ranked what? Number four or five or something. And that goes almost all the way to the end. That means that it's really by the time it goes or by the time the mixture moves from the affluent all the way down, a lot of the citroplan has dropped out of the aqueous phase. It's dropped out of the system, whether that means like it's degrading or absorbing or something like that. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's, um, we know that that's making a difference. We can actually go in and look at, you know, if we look at this in time and we look at the, um, this is the concentration of the compound over the amount that's in the affluent. And so, for example, like metformin down here, you can see it's basically the same at DS1 and DS2. Basically, nothing happens to metformin. It's very water soluble. It is very, it won't biodegrade. It just kind of stays in there. Whereas the citroplan at DS1 is basically, you know, some of it's, but it's pretty similar, right? Whereas DS2, a lot of it has dropped out of the system. So, this paper or this original work was um, published, and we kind of um, I drew up this little thing and it got on the co journal cover of this uh, really good environmental chemistry journal. And um, so I, I like this little bit of, it's sort of like our work or our album art, if we were going to be um, stream science rock stars or something, right? So one of the things that we're continuing to do, and this paper is currently in revision right now, so it's going through a, a re-review at the journal, is we looked at this, what we call the PTP or the parent to product ratio. So that's the concentration of the parent compound, right? The original compound 
and then the concentration of the product compound. So that would be if it turned into a daughter. So what this would mean is that if it's going up, that means that the parent loss is less than the product. If it goes down, it's the parent loss is greater. And if they're the same, that would mean similar attenuation. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and we can see that for um, citriplan, that's, one, that's the one that was really dropping out of the system, that at, you know, it, we can look at what's going on in the effluent, the DS1 and the DS2, and we can see that it's substantially going down over in DS2 in comparison to there. So that means that that is like, you know, we can see that that's changing a lot as opposed to carbamazepine, where that is basically staying the same in the system. So we, what we did was we actually took these things into the lab. And I, I know that there's a lot of chemical structures on this slide and stuff like that. And this makes some people happy and some people gives them bad flashbacks to organic chemistry in college or something, right? But let's just look at this um, simply, which is we look at the parent compound and a product compound, right? So this is something, now it turns into something else. And so we could go through and then look at all these different things in the, in the lab or in the field. And we can also look at them in the lab, which is our next slide here. And basically what we found is that in the stream, product formation was not what was driving these changes. And when we bring them into the lab, we could use batch tests and we could characterize some of the mechanisms we could see the same type of mechanisms as far as like the citroplan dropping out the metformin not changing so this is the we could see that these were good at identifying some of the mechanisms the rates were not really that um good there but what we could see is that some or that it was the variability in terms of what was forming in terms of the parents and the product was really what was it was not really changing very much in the stream. So that leads us to say that biotransformation, like microbial processes within the stream, is not a major um, is not a major process that's going on inside of here. <coughs> so finally, this is a was kind of a little bit of an add-on study that is actually um, was just recently published a couple uh, weeks ago, and our lab also does a lot of work with. Uh, new market pesticides, including the class of neonicotinoids, which are probably what you've heard about as far as like, you know, associated with like harmful effects to pollinators and other things like that. What we did was we actually looked at them in the stream. And what we did was we characterized um, just kind of, this was the mass loads within the system for a couple of different compounds. And we also looked at the, so that's basically through time. And we also looked at the mass loads between the effluent and the downstream for different ones. And what we did, <coughs> and again, I'm happy to, I can, I don't think I can uh, post it by copyright laws, but I can go in and if you send me an email, I'm happy to send you any of these PDFs of papers. But what we did was we did basically a kind of a meta analysis about what are legal applied uses of imidacloprid and clothiant and two really common neonicotinoids you know, that are used primarily, I mean, more in urban uses and as well as agriculture, more in agriculture and not really very much urban uses. And what we looked at was where these things are coming from, because this is a municipal wastewater treatment plant that is, you know, it's a closed, there's no storm sewers, there's no real, um, so there's no non-point sources from things like lawn or golf course applications or anything like that. We kind of looked at some of the mass loads that were in here. And one of the things, these have been found to be a, um, applications to pets has actually been reported to be a major source of mass flux of neonicotinoids in here. And in fact, some of these, the concentrations in the wastewater effluent were actually a, exceeded those in like agricultural runoff. So it's something, I mean, it's probably not a huge, huge mass load to our system, but on a localized um, stream, this is actually a really important thing for the aquatic biota because unlike pharmaceuticals, which are designed to actually, you know, they're bioactive, but they're designed to help people um, and pesticides, right, are designed to kill things, right? So they tend to be more toxic. So these are just as 
these are actually uh, old papers, but these are um, just to give you a little bit of background. This is also a journal cover that we got was we were the first lab to go in and discover neonatroids and finish drinking water. Um, actually, this is from the Iowa River. So um, right in the university tap water and stuff like that, demonstrating that conventional drinking water treatment does not remove neonatroids. And so this is actually one of my grad students that I got to be interviewed on some Washington Post and BBC and stuff. It was kind of cool. Um, and kind of going full circle in terms of looking at some of the stuff wastewater we think is an important thing for people to consider too as well particularly on a localized effects to biota and that is important because one of our continuing things and this is a paper that's currently what we did was we actually looked at it the rq values here are the risk quotients which you're probably familiar with as terms of basically like kind of the red is is high risk medium risk and de minimis risk and we looked at different pharmaceuticals industrial chemicals and pesticides in the stream we could see that depending on what organism class algae invertebrates or fish they had different risk profiles and so in fact you know pharmaceuticals for most things like if we actually just look at the fish there's not really high risk in there um, but for different organisms, particularly invertebrates, we can see that that's driven by the pesticides, which makes sense because they're designed to kill things, right? So we did that. And what we also did was we did what's called stochastic risk modeling. Because one of the things that people sometimes go off of is that, okay, well, if you do everything at base flow, right? It, well, what happens? I mean, we get all kinds of rain and rain doesn't, you know, that can go and have a diluting effect. What we did was we, because of the fact we had these all these baseball measurements, and then what we could do is put them into a Monte Carlo simulation. We could go in and measure these, and then look at basically what are kind of the median risk levels and how do those change. And you could see that base flow is what dominates the system, and the red bars are basically the median risk, right? So this is the actual value. These are the modeled values, and this is the modeled simulation of all flows, and so. You can see that there's actually a relatively small decrease in the risk under um, by including all the flows in there. And obviously, this is focused on just the, those from the wastewater treatment plant because this could also introduce new things from non-point sources as well, too. So we also did some in-stream transport modeling here. And one of our reasons was we were actually trying to look at, okay, well, you know, there are actually two drinking water treatment plants that are downstream from the river into which the this creek discharges what type of potential human health risk would be in here and these are i mean by the time it actually gets diluted into here like i said this is probably represents a very low human health risk what this is you know it demonstrates that the greatest um concern here is actually to the to the aquatic biota that are living within the stream itself so just to kind of talk a little bit about some of the ongoing work and some of the work that the, our partners at UW Milwaukee were and USGS were doing is that we have a paper currently in review right now looking at um, we took water from um, the creek shipped it to uh, Milwaukee and then there were lab fish that were exposed and then going in and looking at hormone effects to developing fish and how it changes like on a genomic and like a transcriptomic level so like how do these things actually affect so we're trying to like connect the chemistry with the effects we did things with yeast estrogen assays and Y's assays which are another estrogenicity thing and so we've also been looking at a whole bunch of other types of things including like PFOS and antibiotic resistance genes and things like that too to try and like really build out the story our whole goal here is to try and connect chemical exposure with effects and that's really hard to do so that's what you know, it's a tall order and it's taken, you know, a couple of years to get this all going, but we really think this is a cool um, angle to go to. So one of the things that is always a very charismatic or um, photogenic kind of charismatic study is we also did a caged fish uh, deployment experiment where we, this is one of the uh, students, Emma and I, and what we did was we um, put in these caged fish. So these were lab native fathead minnows that are native to the stream but they were lap reared and then we put them into the stream and exposed them for a 96 hour period and then collected them and then we were going in and dissecting the fish swabbing them for antibiotic resistance genes taking blood samples and dissecting them and taking 
all the different parts and pieces apart and going in and um, uh, basically we're trying to go in and look at how it all, it, like again, trying to make that connection between exposure and effects. And we also did some electrofishing in here and that was kind of fun because we're trying to go in and look at, you know, potential biological uptake in here. We're, we're also working with a new team um, that are more from, you know, trying to look at groundwater surface water interactions because groundwater, like one of the things is that because it, there's this sudden influx, right, of high flows, right, a, a stream in a temperate region is typically a, a place where groundwater is flowing into a stream. But now you've got a large amount of flow that's in the system that wouldn't have been there. So it's actually above the groundwater table. And so the flow from the stream is now recharging into the groundwater, which is, could be a great thing, right? But we're also recharging all these different pharmaceuticals and other chemicals into the shallow groundwater. So this could potentially provide treatment or other things. So we're trying to work with folks in hydrogeology to understand this better. Um, we can actually see this is actually a Johnny Darter. It's actually a pretty rare freshwater minnow and it's doing quite well in our stream. Um, we also are trying to work with uh, people that are biogeochemical people looking at uptake into emerging aquatic insects and spiders. And finally, I always like to end kind of, kind of a high note here is that you know, we sometimes go and say like, oh, we've got this nasty wastewater coming in here over here and it's coming into the stream. But in a lot of ways, you know, compared to, I mean, this was a, you know, the before 30 years ago, before this plant was upgraded, this was a pretty nasty stream. So this was a major infrastructure improvement that caused the stream to really get better. And we also see that because of the fact that there's no E. coli, there's no agricultural pesticides or herbicides that are in there, we actually get a major dilution effect of things that are like E. coli and atrazine that are in the stream. And in some ways, they're actually improving the water quality. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, apparently I'm allergic to E. coli. So finally, my conclusion here is that pharmaceutical mixtures vary dramatically across a, even a relatively short stream range, creating unique exposure conditions through space and time with the potential for these different mixtures to have interactive effects on biota. And so that can potentially have you know, risk implications for humans. Most likely this is important for the aquatic biota that are in there, but this is a really active area of research and going in and kind of trying to connect these complex mixture effects in the stream with um, actual biological effects on things like fish and, um, and uh, insects and things like that. One of the things that we're trying to do here is we actually have a, a new high resolution mass spectrometer that basically can allow us to see things that we don't know are there. Um, and we just got this about two years ago. And so we're trying to you know, use that to kind of further bridge that gap. So with that, I'd like to thank our funding source for here, our partners at the North Liberty Wastewater Treatment Plant, especially the um, supervisor, um, Drew Lammers there is a wonderful collaborator on here and particularly the grad students, Huey and Danielle, who were instrumental in this particular work and our partners um, over there as well. So with that, I would like to thank everybody for their attention and I'm happy to take any questions. So um, you can put questions into the um, Q&A or uh, also the uh, chat bar, uh, whichever ones, but um, uh, please uh, put them in there and either Dean or myself will uh, read them out to, uh, to Greg. Uh, Greg, I, I had a um, uh, two questions. First of all, you referred to this, the USGS 109, uh, which was, uh, no, so this is a, a battery of uh, compounds that the USGS just as a regular sampling protocol would address, kind of like the PAH, I think it's 18 or, or whatever that, that we look at. Yeah, it's a standard method that they have developed. I think it's, they informally call it farm two or something like that. It was a, a, a standard like, method that they have at the National Water Quality Lab in Denver. And so we, when we collected samples, we've uh, sent them directly to them. And um, so they 
analyzed all those. And there are a few things that are non-pharmaceuticals in there that they measure or things that are maybe marginally pharmaceutical, like uh, caffeine and um, some corrosion inhibitors and a, a couple of pesticides that are just like, kind of like in a lot of their methods. Um, but yeah, they, they have 109 pharmaceuticals in that. They have new, I mean, they are constantly updating it. And, and as they, as new things kind of uh, become more prominent in what is found in the environment, um, but that, uh, yeah, it's a kind of a standard method that they have. We chose our method because we could do that. Um, we don't have the analytical capability of measuring 109 things simultaneously. <laughs> it's it, basically the mass spec runs out of bandwidth, if that makes any sense. Yeah, like um, <laughs> yeah it's, and so like we can go in and we were kind of pushing the boundaries of the ones that are in our own personal lab, like the one over in the high res facility in the basement of chemistry has a lot more power, but we could, I think we put in like 17 or 18 different compounds and, and, and it, like isotopically labeled standards and stuff like that. And the reason why we did that was so that we could take samples over a longer time period. So two years instead of one, and then we did it every other week. So bi-weekly instead of just once monthly for a year. So it's, um, and that, so we did, got different things, but in our preliminary USGS sampling, those compounds were found to basically, the top 15 things represented about 85% of the, the mass in the system. So that was, we could explain a lot of it with, you know, something by, that we could do. By looking at that now your group, yeah, with a higher temporal frequency. Okay. Yeah. Um, that doesn't obviously represent, you know, there could be some things that we're, are present at relatively trace levels that could have a high, you know, biological significance, but we just base things on mass and what we could measure and stuff. Okay. And we tried to avoid controlled substances. So <laughs> avoiding uh, DEA permits for pharmaceuticals. Yeah, yeah, I know. Like, so, yeah, we're trying to precipitate this back out. <laughs> so um, we so, have a few questions in the chat, Stephen. Yes, I, I see I see that. So one of the one of the questions we have here is was this stream that we were looking at impaired? And of course, what we're referring to there is the state has said that it's impaired for say aquatic life or or fish consumption. Yeah, originally it was I I think it was on the 303D list for E. coli a okay. long time ago. Um, but and I know that it has it doesn't meet all of the requirements for like aquatic life in terms of, I mean, as far as like, it's relatively, it's kind of a medium like IBI scores in terms of the index of biological integrity and things like that, but it's not impaired for any chemicals. Um, these things, all the things that we are looking at, none of them are like, um, I mean, not I guess part with of the exception of atrazine or none of them are regulated in any way. So like yeah. none of the things that the wastewater treatment plant was putting in were any permit violations or anything like that. They were doing everything completely right. It's just that these things are in the water and that's because people take them um, and our infrastructure is not designed explicitly to remove them. Yeah. And, and of course, you raise the, the other point that a lot of the, the compounds that you know we find concerning are not actually captured under 303D. Uh, we always point out that you know there are physical constraints to waterways that are not covered by 303D. But in fact, there's also a lot of chemistry out there that's not captured by it. Sure. Right. Um, yeah. And actually, like, I mean, now, um, you know, it, because of the, the fact that it's a membrane bioreactor and it's like captures all of the bacteria, it actually, the water quality when the effluent is in there actually improves the, the E. coli. I mean, it makes the, it lowers the E. coli levels in the stream compared to the upstream. So it's- A lot of people on meeting today is going, are love hearing, love hearing that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, then the next question is, is, is your work feeding into the larger research effort on pharmaceutical effects? Yeah, we, that's what our goal is. And we are trying to, I mean, our lab is not a fish lab or something like that in the same way that like, that's what the, the Great Lakes Genomic Center and that's why we're working with the folks at UW-Milwaukee and USGS who, and that's, uh, Luke Iwanowicz is at the, the Eastern Ecological Research Center in, in Leetown, West Virginia. And um, yeah, like I said, Rebecca Clapper is the director of the Great Lakes Genomic Center at UW-Milwaukee in the freshwater sciences. And what we're trying to do is they're definitely doing the effects based. And I mean, our recent manuscript and review is like, 
really looking at things like doing things like RNA sequencing and really advanced uh, methods to try and understand what types of pathways are affected on in fish and then trying to make some of those um, connections with the chemistry. Um, it's definitely a big challenge um, because we're always working on this spectrum, right, of doing something that's like, and even some of our stuff, right, we, we can make highly contrived controlled lab studies, and then we can make realistic field studies. But then you lose some of the control and you have more degrees of freedom and you might do some things that you don't necessarily understand fully. And so we really like this site as kind of like a field laboratory, but um, you know, making or bridging that gap is something that's a major uh, challenge. And actually, I recently hosted a thing for um, it was a, a global webinar uh, about a month ago, and that was actually our topic. It was called bridging the gap, trying to link advances in analytical chemistry to biological effects. And so we had. Uh, three world experts and I invited Rebecca to be one of the speakers there and stuff like that. So we um, had a, another person from Illinois and then somebody from UC Davis and talking about how like trying to bridge those gaps because ultimately that's what we care about, right? If something's, maybe something is in the water at 10,000 nanograms per liter, but if it's not something that's going to have a, a high biological effect, then maybe it doesn't matter in the same way. So we, if we can focus our efforts, the, the problem is that also that there's just so many things out there that it's, I mean, that's where things like trying to understand like modeling and effects and uh, are, will be very powerful. Yeah, and uh, more seem to be, uh, it seem to be surfacing faster than we get the grips with how to monitor and evaluate them. Um, so and, uh, another question here, and I'm hoping um, I've, I've got this correct. Um, it said, have you been able to measure the impacts uh, on any of these uh, pharmaceutical uh, concentrations from any of the you know, collection programs that have been put in place? So these, and I assume what we're talking here is these collection programs where, you know, you know don't flush your, um, you know, right, right, right. Your, your pills down, yeah. the, the, uh, down the toilet, instead, you know, put them into a collection thing. Have you seen any studies that suggest that those can actually have an impact here? Um. On this particular study, I mean, we started this work in 2017. And so like, this has been all relatively recent and those programs, at least in our local area in Johnson County have been in place for much longer than that. Um, as far as like drug take break programs and education programs, as far as like throw your stuff away in cat litter and, and or take it back to the pharmacy instead of you know flushing it and stuff. But it, so, I think that those things probably would have already been kind of baked into the data. Yes, into here. this, into this information. Um, but in that and sense, it wasn't the objective of this particular study. Yeah, so not in this particular study, but I, I mean, in the larger sense, from what I've read, that those can be very effective. Um, but that said, like we still see these really large levels, and most of them are because people are actively taking them. It's not necessarily that they're going in. One of the things that I think is really interesting that sometimes people don't think about is that um, there are some compounds, like for example, the type two diabetes drug that I was showing that metformin is kind of a really kind of an emerging thing that is, and people take that at very high levels and it's not meant to be uh, metabolized by the human body. So it goes in and it leaves and the high levels are what causes the pharmacological effect. Other compounds, and I would say most pharmaceuticals are designed to be in some capacity metabolized by the human body. And so sometimes what people actually do, if they're doing like just a mass balance on what's coming in versus what's coming out of a treatment plant, they, people sometimes actually see like mass being created because what happens is that it might come in kind of what they call masked as some sort of of conjugated metabolite that it means that you've got the drug and then the human body goes like the liver or something like that goes and then put something else onto it, which is designed to do. And then when you like, typically most pharmaceuticals are urinated. And so it's like, it leaves and it comes into the treatment plant, but the bacteria that are in there will go in and break that chemical bond very quickly and very easily. And they'll oftentimes it's a sugar that's added. So they'll eat that. And then the pharmaceutical, the active ingredient will like come back, which is one of the reasons why it's so valuable doing some of the studies that we have in terms of looking at not only the 
the active ingredient, but also some of the transformation products, both from bacteria as well as from human bodies, because um, then you get a much fuller picture of it. So if all you're doing is looking at just what you're looking for, you'll miss the big picture. Yep, got it. So the next question is, um, you had those uh, very interesting graphics showing the pie charts and the sort of the, the uh, changes in the different families of compounds and the, the mass detected sure. as we move downstream in summer and winter. And I know that you had said that, um, you know, I mean, of course, automatically when you saw the difference between summer and winter, my brain went to, well, this is bacterial activity, which your research had kind of ruled out as being a major, major factor, if I got that correct. Um, yeah, we, it is something, I mean, that's, it is kind of curious and we don't have a, the best explanation for it. When we go and we do things in some of these batch biodegradation tests, we don't get the same removal kinetics that we do in, that we seem to observe in the field, which is kind of a, an interesting um, phenomenon. And so we, logically, we would think that the greater amounts of bacteria and bacteria, like, you know, more higher temperatures, the water would make it so that it's uh, more effect or it would biodegrade faster in the, in the stream. But I don't think that that's the full answer. And we don't completely understand why at this point. Um, so it's kind of an interesting um, thing. And that's actually one of the big take homes from one of the papers that we have reviewed right now is that sometimes the a lot of like regulatory things like some of the standardized OECD methods or the eight or in people using Europe or in the EPA methods in the US or something like that. If you want to go in and evaluate biodegradation of a compound to understand for regulatory purposes, people do like, oh, you grab a batch and you spike it in and you do that. And those that might not necessarily fully characterize. I mean, it gives you a good indication of what's going to happen to it, but it's not necessarily going to give you a good indication of how fast in the same way. And yeah. in the in the stream, there's a lot more processes that are active, and uh, we, we just didn't necessarily predict that some of the other things would be, um, I mean, there's a lot of factors, like, for example, you know, tree cover is high in the, in the summertime. It's almost a very forested floodplain, so there's probably not a whole lot of sunlight that gets through in terms of, like, photo transformation, which can be really relevant to a lot of mm -hmm. drugs. But in the wintertime, the sun's generally a lot weaker, so, like, I don't know which... What would be the interplay between those two yeah. things comes out yeah yeah it's, it's it's and certainly we do a lot of statistical evaluation of you know ibis and fish species and the macroinvertebrate species to a lot of the more um pedestrian pollutants ammonias and chlorides uh -huh. and such yeah there's always a factor in there that there's just there's an empirical relationship here but we don't know what it is um and, and the, the question that that i was uh talking about there about the breakdown of these was, you know, the, the gentleman who asked it was asking if um, uh, it was, uh, you know, that these, if we could identify uh, where these are being metabolized, broken down or captured, if that perhaps might help uh, inform wastewater treatment plants about how to, uh, how to deal with these uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, products. Yeah, potentially. I mean, if you knew more about which ones were most susceptible to um, I mean, for example, the, what I talked about, like that antidepressant citrus plan that, I mean, basically what we find is that it's just sorbing onto the bed sediment. So that's like, that's not necessarily a desirable outcome, but yeah. if you did see that if it was going in and like very labile and biodegrading within the stream, maybe that would be less of a concern in terms of like worrying about it in the treatment plant itself. Um, it, but yeah, it could certainly inform that. That's one of the reasons why we're so excited about this new high resolution mass spec that is like, instead of one decimal place, we can get like, you know, seven decimal places and get really exact masses of different things and really kind of characterize the entire full spectrum profiles of these complex mixtures. And because sometimes things can turn into stuff that we don't even know exists. Um, so we can, um, it's a powerful new tool to be able to make some of these connections that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So really happy with that. <laughs> I'm going to read this other question out directly because uh, I'm not quite sure I get it, but it was saying, um, considering that these uh, chemicals are present, uh, are somewhat ubiquitous, 
how can we be sure, how can you be sure that your control fish are not truly impacted by these chemicals? Um, presumably the control fish that are, uh, I, I'm assuming uh, maybe uh, the, these oh, were the, the cage fish, uh, probably the, the, the lab raised, but in stream, you were saying 92. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I so, I mean, I what we did was the way that we designed that experiment was so that we lab reared the fish until they were, you know, little minnows and stuff like that. So they're, that's basically very controlled. I mean, we can use, you know, like high purity water and create, you know, synthetic fresh water and, you know, so the pH and the saline and, you know, ions and stuff like that are all correct. They all start out at the same base level. And then what we did was we designed the experiment so that we're basically, I mean, there's always going to be, we don't know what the baseline level of things that might be in the background is, right? There could be trace levels of all kinds of endocrine disruptors or things that could have biological effects in the upstream, right? That could be there. So that's why we had the upstream um, caged fish as our baseline. And so then what we're doing is we're comparing the downstream fish to that baseline. And then when we're doing our genetic uh, sequencing comparisons, what we do is then we compare our downstream with our upstream, because then basically what you're doing is you're implicitly including whatever um, upstream effects there are in there and the differences in gene upregulation or something like that, or hormonal differences are the presumably the putative result of the actual, uh, that additional exposure that's there. Um, obviously it's not perfect, um, but that's because we're able to control everything in the lab and get them at the same baseline and then bring them in. Um, the other fish that we use for some of the initial exposure experiments and stuff like that, where we took the water and brought the, that into the, the lab fish, those are actually like model zebra fish and stuff like that. So it's very, you know, the genomes are all sequenced and it's very like controlled and stuff. The fathead minnows, uh, we want to make it more realistic and also like in order to get a DNR permit, we can't just like put lab fish like we need, needed native fish that are okay to be in the stream in case they were to somehow or another get out or something yeah, so kind of like a field blank yes exactly so um, those were i mean we've caught plenty of fathead minnows just we could see them in the stream and stuff so <laughs> yeah yeah you knew they were the, they were there right. um okay any other uh questions from anyone going once uh, so I'm going to, there's a couple of comments here. Oh, uh, um, well, there was a comment about the macroinvertebrates testing, and you were pointing out that there were people, in fact, looking at um, uh, in, um, invertebrates in terms of accumulation of, of these uh, compounds. Yeah, we're trying to start that. Um, we actually have a, a new kind of collaboration with some of that um, grant pending and stuff like that to see if that can go somewhere, some our collaborators in North Carolina, um, where they study emergent more they do it mostly from a uh, like metals and at mining sites and stuff but they were interested so they actually they were collecting spiders at midnight during the direco so it's kind of a bad combination if you know about the weather here last year, summer um but we um yeah we're trying to do some things with that and then this stream has been evaluated for ibi things and stuff by the state hygienic lab which does a lot of things with freshwater or science and stuff like that too so um We've been trying to develop into that, and uh, they're because they are obviously they spend their entire lives or most of their lives, or in at least in the larval stage and stuff like that in the water. So yes. Uh, so it's, it's just sum, summing up like a couple of comments that we had here was that uh, people are glad that folks like you are looking at this. Obviously, this is a, a you know developing area and that you know some some troubling uh, compounds out there floating around when you start to look at how ubiquitous they are and that we're not entirely sure how they operate in the environment or um in biology outside the, the sort of you know the the immediate human interaction when that when when they're taken um i'd also just mention that you know we we um originally heard greg speak at the emerging contaminant conference here in illinois which is just an excellent conference um dean and i both attended it and i think tom i know tom Minarek, who's uh uh, with MWRD was also in, in attendance. Uh, following that workshop, I was afraid to both live in my house or to go outside for a while, but um, it's uh, better to be informed. <laughs> anyway. 
And so, I mean, sometimes like it's really interesting to think about, like, because I, I gave this kind of or a, a topic on well, we were talking about actually about like the neonicotinoids toys and drinking water and you know, like that. That study got a whole lot of people scared the pants off people, right? That's why it got into the news, right? Yeah. And you know, in this, one of the reasons why we kind of like to to demonstrate an end kind of on this, and I was presenting some work to the Iowa Flood Center, and you know, somebody asked like, well, how, how do you live, right? Like it's like, and I said, well, the same way that you think about flooding, right? It has to be contextualized in the way, in the context of risk, right? So that's why we really wanted to put things in terms of like understanding what the risk is to different organisms. And then also looking at like the, like how that risk gets translated into potential human in health. And then also what that means in terms of different modeling and risk assessments and stuff like that the one thing that we can't do with that because we don't have these capabilities is how risk changes when you're having interactive effects and so that's something that's an active area of research for ecotoxicologists and you know the models just i mean because we just don't know enough about these things um to be able to do that and so i think that's a um that's why understanding there's surprisingly little information about there about food complex mixture uh, because it's just so difficult, right? So we can characterize some of the complex mixtures and that's some of the first steps. And then we're trying to make the connections to biological effects, but to be able to have those predictive type of capabilities and understand risk in it, uh, uh, that type of way is, is important, so. Yeah, the, those synergistic or nullifying effects, and that's a dizzying array of possibilities. Uh, right. there's, you know. It explodes quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so with that, Greg, um, I you already had sent me over the paper on the uh, pesticides, but the, the papers you refer to, if you want to send them to me, I can house them and then uh, people want to uh, read them. Um, people can contact me and I'll make sure they get them or you can contact Greg directly. He's sure. got his contact information there at the, the uh, Fever Lab. Uh, Greg, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us about this day. I, I guess right. my, my, my final item would be if you had one word of advice to um, you know, wastewater treatment plant managers or indeed stormwater managers who are, you know, looking at this um, uh, area, what would be the single thing that they should should be thinking about as they're, as they're um, you know, working forward at the sort of the, in the trenches about trying to uh, deal with some of these pollutants? Yeah, well, that's, a, I guess, a tough uh, thing to think about. But um, I think what, what is important to think about and to consider is that, like, what goes on in the home really matters. Um, and I mean, in this particular case, what we particularly, I mean, I think what was so illustrative when we were looking at some of the things with the neonicotinoids is we think of these as being agricultural pesticides mm -hmm. and that's all of what we're doing there. And this, in this case, because there's not, it's a, a closed, um, system, separated sewers, no stormwater impacts. That means that these things are going, whatever people were finding in these means that it's going, it's getting directly put in to the wastewater system from within people's homes. It's not from yards or non yeah, sources that, or that anything was, like that. So that, that means was that this is like a potential unanticipated uh, human exposure route too. Um, so I mean, obviously people have demonstrated that pets are a major source and stuff like that, but also things like indoor pest control and all these other things. But people sometimes don't appreciate what's going on inside the home, not only from like the contributions of to uh, a wastewater system, but also thinking about what that means to their own health and their own family too, because that's an important thing. If they're going in and, um, I mean, for example, one of the, the this uh, sewer shed has a lot of, um, of uh, like, because it's near the university, they have a, a lot of uh, like multifamily units and a lot of them has um, monthly pest control systems that are, are part of their lease. And so like everybody has to have uh, like go into their apartment once a month, they go and have very, you know, drains and things like that sprayed and floors sprayed for, I don't know, cockroaches or other things or ants or termites mm -hmm. or whatever they're doing. I mean, we can see a little bit from sort of like, you know, wastewater forensic type of thing that, but that means that if you've got a six month old um, crawling on the floor, they're also yeah, exposed I mean, to those. Yeah. Right. And that's not something that you think of it in the same way that 
you would if you have like a licensed agricultural pesticide applicator going in and using these in an occupational setting. Yeah, we don't have the same human exposure there. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. All well, right. got it. Greg, once again, thanks so much for spending the time with us this morning. Really appreciate it. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Round of applause. Obviously, that's right. the thing about Zoom. It just kills that. But there you uh, go. Well, got a lot of good comments. Where people really enjoyed your talk. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we're moving on to our our business items. And we're on number three in the agenda, the wastewater permit special conditions. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, Dave, 